What book of the Bible have we been in? Matthew. And what passage? What part of it? What's it called? Sermon on the Mount. That's what we've been in. So, and it started all, and you probably remember this, but it started all with the holidays and thinking of what we would do with eight months of our life or a year of our life. You know, what would, would be we, we'd be willing to sacrifice for? What would we be willing to put aside? What would we be willing to, um, <laughs> yeah, go to stri- uh, leaps and bounds that we may not go to normally? And we talked about how the Magi traveled for four months just to get to where Jesus was and then had to travel four months back. And so that was at least eight months of their life just to see Jesus. And we talked about that challenge and how that could come into us in this new year on what could we this year, what is God challenging us this year to do with eight months of our life, a year of our life, to be focused and to get closer to Him. So we got started here in the Sermon on the Mount, which is after that um, passage in, in Matthew 2 about the Magi. And we're looking, first of all, at the character that God desires. Do we desire... To have character, to have an attitude that pleases God. That's kind of the first question, isn't it? Before you look at any of these character qualities, you first have to make a statement in your mind, do I care? It, does it matter to me? Do I want to know what God desires in the character and the attitude he wants me to have or not? Now, maybe I could assume to a, at least some sort of level that We've done this for a couple weeks now that you do, and that's why you're here. And in a positive note, I'm going to assume that, okay? Whether you do or not, I'm going to assume that you want to hear about the character quality today that God wants for you. It's based on Matthew 5.5. 5. Look at it this morning. Very, you know, very big, big verse. Blessed are the, and it depends what version you have, gentle, meek, humble, Lowly, <laughs> well, it depends on your version. But the key word really is meekness. In my version, it says gentle, but if you look, it has a number and it goes over and says humble or meek. But je- blessed are the gentle or the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Meekness does not equal weakness. But the, and we could say meekness does equal humility. There's an aspect of it. I just want to throw out this question to start with. Or this thought, maybe. What would it take to humble you? That is so true sometimes, isn't it? What would it take for God to do in your life to humble you? But how, for each of us specifically, is knockdown look like? How often have you seen somebody that you're just like, how low do they need to go in order for them to humbly come before God? Usually we don't say that of ourselves because we're not thinking about it. Maybe others are saying it of us. How low do we need to go? How low does that person, how low does George need to go in order for him to finally look towards the Lord? I've, uh, there's been a lot of uh, death lately, a lot of hardship lately and that uh, I've been personally involved in, I guess you could say. And, and it just helps you to realize in one statement, I, uh, if you heard about the St. Pierre family, um, yesterday I was able to do a memorial service at their farm and there was probably, it was 50 to 70 people there. Um, people, co-workers, um, people in, in other parts of the industry that knew them. Um, but what an awesome privilege it was to be able to share the gospel with many people who had never heard it before. I told them that, I would, that if I was going to do it, I had to share the gospel, and they said they wanted that. Um, what a devastating thing for that young man to have killed somebody. And, he, and this young man is very gentle, very just caring. He's not, you know, he's not a cocky, arrogant kid. And, uh, and so this has been very hard on their family, hard on him. Right on his father. Can you imagine being a father of a boy just barely starting out in the prime of his life and having him have to deal with this? It's a tough thing to think about. So we can understand it. And the kid said this little thing, because last week he went to back to the farm one day and 
He said, all these things that we do seem so insignificant, right? After some tragedy has happened like that, you know, what would it take to humble you when you see um, death in this way? It's a very easy thing to, to be humble and to say, how does my life matter? One thing that that young man has said, though, is that same thing. He's like, it just shows me life is short. And I need to make my life count. He's getting it. Be praying for them. um, Because I've been able to share the word with them in many different angles and ways for that whole family. And yesterday for many people in that that are connected to them. Um, But I know that uh, when I was thinking of this meanness, it's like, oh my word. Even just being involved in that whole situation helped Tom help me. Sorry. Meekness defined. I'm going to just say some things because there was so much in the definition of this that explained it also. And I wanted to share it all with you um, because we're going to look at meekness defined, meekness expressed, and then meekness gained. Meekness defined, a, a condition of the mind and heart which demonstrates gentleness, not weakness, but in power. Not in weakness, but in power. Let me say that again. A condition of the mind and heart which demonstrates gentleness, <clears throat> not in weakness, but in power. It had in the, in the definition this. It's expressed not in an outward behavior. So meekness is not something that's it's, uh, it's an outward thing. It's an inward grace of the soul, first and chiefly directed toward God. It's an inward grace of the soul uh, that's directed toward God. In fact, in this way, and this is all in this definition, it was kind of amazing how much was in it, but we ex- that we accept God's dealings with us as good and do not dispute or resist. We accept God's dealings in our life as good and do not dispute or resist. You know, yesterday when I was sharing there, the part of uh, the beginning of my message was... Uh, um, I kind of shared from the word twice, the gospel and then something before, but the something before was this. You know, uh, that in Psalm 27, there's this beautiful verse that I caught my eye last time I read through the Bible. And it said, we would have despaired if we had not seen the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Anybody ever been there? That you, if, if you had not realized some good that God was showing, had seen in your life, you would have despaired. That's why when we are struggling, we need Jesus. We need God. We need that hope that only he can give us. Because if not, what is going to change our despair? And if anything that's going to is going to be temporary or and or lead us into more despair in the future. Only God can lead us out of that despair. But then we think of that idea that do we truly trust him? Do we truly believe Romans 8, 28? That God works all things together for good to those who are called according to his purpose. For those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Do we truly believe it? It's easy to say yes when things are going well. Is it not? You may not even know the answer to that question until you get into the fire of trial. Until you get into that, that moment where you are at the end of yourself and you have to trust God. Can I? That verse does go on to say, because there's more to it than that verse, and we use it that way quite often. But it, the next verse says, to be conformed to the image of his son. What is God causing to be good in your life is for you to become more like Jesus. That's the good. But by the way, the verse does not say, all things are good. You get that? In this world you have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world, Jesus said. It doesn't say all things are good. It says that, God will work things out for good, but not all things are good because we live in a sin-cursed world. This idea of meekness, Aristotle said something about it, maybe going on a different track a little bit, but with the idea of meekness, Aristotle said it's the middle course of being angry. Meekness is not getting angry without any reason, but it's also not ever getting angry or not getting angry at all. In other words, meekness is getting angry when it matters, because it matters. And remember in this definition, where is 
where is my meekness headed towards? Towards God. So when I get angry, why am I getting angry? Because anger is, a, by the way, an emotion from God. Be careful with some of you where you take that from, because I'm going to explain a little. <laughs> anger is an emotion from God because anger motivates me. Right? It can motivate me to fix things and be good, or it can motivate me to destroy. Correct? It's a, but it is a motivating emotion that God has given to each one of us. But the point is, is my anger motivating me towards God and others towards God, or is it motivating me or others towards me? That's a good way to say whether your anger is righteous or not. Is it, be, is it pointing people towards Christ, or is it pointing people towards me? Just a little thing. But anyways, that, he says that meekness is that, that power, that even uh, motivation, that's right. And, and he kind of explained this way. Meekness is getting angry at the right time, in the right measure, and for the right reason. Good way to say it. So that's meekness. Jesus was said to be meek over and over again. Was, was Jesus weak? Was Jesus weak? He was not weak, but he was meek. Power, under control. That's kind of a simple way to say it. If you want to just have one way to define meekness, say power under control. But, the, but there's so much more to it, and that's why I wanted to explain that to you uh, this morning. Before we get into meekness expressed and, and gained, let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer to guide us through this journey. Lord, I pray that you would help us to understand this character quality that you desire us to have in our life. I pray that you will open our minds and hearts to your word this morning so that we can be conformed to the image of your son and be more like Jesus not just in our outward actions, but in the inward parts of who we are that will lead to our actions. In Jesus' name, amen. Meekness Express, a good place to start there is, is Jesus, Matthew eleven twenty nine. How is my meekness? If, if I'm to be meek, how does that express itself? Hebrews 11, uh, Matthew eleven twenty nine. We'll start with 28. Come to me. All you who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle, meek, and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. What is one way that I am to express my meekness? Is how I relate to others. How I relate to others. So, let's look at that. When people come to you, what do they get? Think of this verse. People, Jesus said, come to me. All you are heavy and laden, I will give you rest. When people come to you, what do they get? Do they get impatience? Yeah, I'll listen to you for a moment, but, you know, don't waste too much of my time. Yeah, I care, but not that much. Do they get impatience? When people come to you and they're burdened and heavy laden, do they get impatience? Do they get a, I don't really care, attitude, where you don't really want to hear it at all? You know, we, in America, we love this uh, greeting. How you doing? Good. How you doing? Good. Liar. <laughs> but you're happy that they said good, because you don't really want to hear what their problems are. Isn't that too often true? Really? Because if somebody actually stopped and said, oh my word, are you serious right now? You ain't that bad off, talk to somebody else. Too often we just have an I don't care attitude. We're not like Jesus who would take time, any time, when somebody would come to him. And it's easy to say, well, he didn't have a job, but did, was he on a mission? Was his mission maybe more important than mine? Are you not sure of that? Was Jesus' mission maybe more important than whatever mine is? Uh, I think so. I hope so. If you don't believe that, why the heck are you here? You're wasting your time. 
do they get a caring attitude when people come to you? Do they, do they say, wow, this person cares? Can you give them only a short amount of time and have them still know you care? Yes or no? Yes, yes you can. People usually do know whether you care or not. You may say, hey, I've only got this much time right now, but I'd like to get back to you, and I will be praying for this in the meantime. Let's set a time. There is a way to get around those, you know, other things of life that we do have to do, right? The idea is what's going on in our heart. When people come to us, do they see a giving attitude where we're willing to give maybe time, maybe money, maybe sacrifice, whatever. We're willing to just give, and they see that in us. Are you doing anything in your power to relate to that person? Do they see that when they come to you that even if you haven't gone through exactly what they do, they have or are, that you care and you, you can empathize with them? Now, you may not have the gift of mercy like my mother does, which I don't have, but you can still care for people, right? You don't have to have that true gift that it flows out from you every inch of who you are and you, that's not an excuse not to care and try to empathize with people where they're at because I think all of us here I want oh, just a reality check if there's somebody you truly care about do you try to empathize with them so the key is not that we can't empathize with people the key is that we don't care about them and so we don't is that true I know that I struggle with that, and that's come on my mind even more lately, I think, is that some people it's so much easier to empathize with. It's so much easier to, to get what they're feeling and to um, understand their struggle and their burden and to be right there with them. And then other people, maybe they're different personality than me, maybe they just have different circumstances, I don't know. It's just, it is not so easy. And if I'm not in the spirit, my flesh is going to say, yeah, whatever, you know, and try to avoid it. But when I'm in the spirit, I'm going to want to know. So we understand that there's a natural tendency to relate to certain people better than others, but with Christ and the Holy Spirit, we can relate to anybody and should. So how, how's meekness expressed? How do, how do we relate to others? When people come to you, what do they get? When people are in sin. Look at Galatians 6.1. We're going to be looking at some verses this morning. Going through a little around the Bible a little bit. It's in the New Testament. Galatians 6.1. Brethren, if, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, meekness, same word. Each one look into yourself so that you too will not be tempted. Restore such a one. If somebody is caught up in sin, when people are in sin, what is your relate? How do you relate to them? How do you relate to them? Are you condemning? Are you considerate? Look at 2 Timothy 2, 24 and 26. It goes along the same lines. Over a few pages to your right. 2 Timothy 2. Therefore, if anyone comes, uh, wait, not that. I went back too far. Uh, Twenty-four. The Lord's bond servant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wrong, with gentleness, word meekness, same word, correcting those who are in opposition. If perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth, and they may come to. I like this verse. They may come to their senses and escape the snare of the de devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. Does sin kind of get us out of our senses? In other words, it doesn't even matter if it makes sense, I'm going to do it. When I'm really enslaved to a sin, then it doesn't have to make sense, I will continue to do it, right? So I love how he says that when we come to people in gentleness, in meekness, we can sometimes help them to come back to their senses and escape the snare of the devil. Is that what's happening when people, come, when people are in sin and you know about it? Are you going to them and trying to help them with meekness 
gentleness. Remember, gentleness is power under control. Why do you have power? Because you have the Holy Spirit and you have the Word of God. You don't have power in and of yourself. If you do, then you're not going to amount to anything in their life anyway. But you have power because you have the Holy Spirit residing inside you and you have the Word of God that you can have with you. And so when you come and speak into people's life with meekness, the power is not from yourself, the power is from God, and you can speak into their life. And when you think of gentleness, that refers to us. Are you coming gently, like was in um, Galatians 6.1 also. In gentleness, come alongside each one. So, when people come to you, what do they get? Just people who are hurting. When people come to you who are in sin, what do they get? If they don't even come to you and you go to them, how, how are they, what are they getting from you when you try to speak to them? Ephesians 4, 1 through 3. Going back to the left a few pages. The same word. This is how we relate to others. Uh, I think this passage was used last week by um, Dave. Um, but we're going to just look at a couple verses here. Ephesians 4, 1. Uh, yeah, let's start with verse 1. Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which we are called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance to one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, as also you are called in one hope of your calling. Meekness is expressed by the way that we strive to have unity with each other. Are we trying to? Because are we different? Do those differences annoy you? Oh yeah, sometimes. That's a, that's a good way to say it. Sometimes. And... And sometimes are they going to grate on you? And sometimes you, is somebody else going to think they're totally right and be totally different than what you think is totally right? By the way, God does not desire uniformity in the church where we have to dress the same, look the same, be cookie-cutter Christians. That's not in Scripture. But what is in Scripture is in our diversity that there's unity. You get that? In our differences... There is a, uni a unifying quality, and that is the Holy Spirit that's inside us. Anybody here, just a little example of that, anybody here ever met a stranger who was a Christian and you had something in common with them, you, like, immediately? Ever get it? That's the unity of the Spirit. Now, why is it so much easier to have that unity with a stranger than it is the person I know sitting beside me? You don't know their flaws yet. Good point, Bridget. Yeah, because you don't know their flaws, so you don't have to be like, uh, yes, be gracious towards that, do you? Because you don't know them. That's a good point. But God says in meekness, that character expressed in our life will show unity in the body of Christ. Meekness expressed. James 3, 13 and 14. talks in James 3 is talking about the tongue and then uh, and after it gets talking about the tongue being a fire you know where fresh water can come out of it and and bitter water can come out of it we all understand how that can happen and then in verse 13 it says who among you is wise in understanding let it show by his good deeds by his behavior his deeds in the gentleness the meekness of wisdom but if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. He's using that contrast that if I'm in meekness, I'll be the opposite of being jealous and bitter. Jealous and bitter is on this side of the coin, or not the same coin, but on this side, and meekness is on this side. Meekness is the opposite of being jealous, it's the opposite of being bitter. In, in other words, if, if the opposite of bitter, what word would come to your mind? If I'm not bitter, I am sweet. Okay, that's true. <laughs> Hadn't thought of that one. So if I am sweet, never mind, I'm going to have to tell you, because we're on a totally different place. What? Yeah, there you go. That was the word I was looking for. Because <laughs> if I'm bitter towards somebody, I, the opposite is sweet. Um, and if I'm sweet, then I'm gracious, and if I'm gracious, I'm forgiving. Hey, let's go down that road, huh? There we go. We got there. 
But that is the opposite. So if I'm meek, I'm going to be a forgiving person. And that's, by the way, going to help with unity too, isn't it? I'm not only going to be willing to forgive, I'm going to be willing to be forgiven. It goes both ways. Meekness expressed. With others being more important than myself. With having the attitude that you are more important than me. And boy, is that tough, isn't it? Because you don't look that important. We laugh. I like saying what we really think, even though we wouldn't express it out loud, right? Don't call me bad. You've had the same thought. James 121, same page over maybe on the other side. We talked about how we relate to others. Now it's how do we relate to the Word of God? How is meekness expressed in my life and how I relate to the Word of God? Uh, Matthew 121, I mean James 121 says, Therefore putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness in humility, in meekness, receive the Word implanted which is able to save your souls. So how is meekness expressed when I come to the Word of God? I am willing because of the, uh, the picture the illustration they use in, in um, James 1, if you want to look at it on your own, is a mirror, right? So when you come to the Word of God, it's like coming to a mirror and you see yourself exposed. All the zits and the wrinkles and the gray hair or lack of hair or whatever else defect you have, the old scars from when you were a kid. My kids are going to have a lot of them on their head for some reason, maybe more than yours, I don't know why. Maybe. Talking about every one of us. But the point is you see everything, right? The good, the bad, and the ugly is visible right there. And it says, if you are coming to the Word of God in meekness, you're willing to see those things and see how the Word of God exposes them and then do something about it based on what the Word of God tells you. When you come to the Word of God, you come to it with meekness saying, God, teach me. God, show me you so I can see me and therefore change to be more like you. Did you get that one? What, Julie? Can I write you can't write it down, okay. Did you get it, though? Do you come to the Word of God to say, show me me, and then so I see you, so I can see how I, can, how I should change to become like you? That's meekness expressed in the way we come to the Word of God. 1 Peter 3.15, our last one on meekness expressed. You could say it's how we relate to others, but it's more specific, I think. 1 Peter 3.15 says, But sanctify Christ in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with meekness and reverence. Does your... Man, this could come out in many ways. How you share Christ with others, does it show a meek attitude? Does the meekness that's inside you, because remember this is not an outward thing, meekness is something, an inner quality of who you are. So is because you are meek, therefore you are sharing Christ with others. Not only is it showing an attitude of meekness as you share, but is because of you being meek of heart, you care about others so much that you can't keep your mouth shut about him in a gentle, loving, considerate way. Um, maybe I should say passionate way, because it matters most. Then something that, because I've been praying for, many, I got a big list of people I'm praying for that I've actually even, many of them shared Christ with in the past, in, but not all of them. But I've been share, I've been talking to some of these people, and what has challenged me lately is when is it going to stop and be talk? and be the gospel. Because a lot of times we can say, well, we got to build a relationship with them first. But then when does that stop? Not stop. But when does it change to become the gospel? Because being their buddy does not get them to heaven. Being somebody they can just talk about the weather to does not get them to heaven. They need to hear the truth of the word of God, the gospel, clearly, plainly, in order for them to make a decision whether they like me or not. And, and I've had different opportunities lately, just where I've, I've uh, 
talked and I'm trying to truly be open to the Holy Spirit telling me when I'm supposed to say the gospel and when I'm supposed to just be a buddy. And sometimes I'm not sure. There's got to be a time where maybe it's just me thinking I still need to be the buddy when I'm supposed to be actually sharing Christ. And I don't know about you, but I'm, this is a real challenge for me because I want to be obedient to the Spirit at the moment He wants me to be and not be presumptuous, not do it ahead of time or whatever. So to me, that's a real life prayer for me to God. Because I don't know about you, but time is getting short. Because it always is. And we, I want to see people come to know Christ as their Savior. And I hope that you do too. And we can't just keep not talking to anybody. And we can't just keep talking to people. We've got to come to a point where we share the truth of the gospel. Because if not, what is your life worth living? You, if you are a believer this morning and you are not sharing Christ with people, then you might as well have died at the moment that you got saved and gone to heaven. Because you're of no use to God here on earth if you will not open your mouth. This idea of, what do you call it? Uh, what was the old thing? It was from the 70s, 80s, but it's still around. Uh, what is it? Relationship evangelism. I, I don't know if that was the exact word, but that explains it. What's that? Friendship, Friendship evangelism. That is so pathetic because most of those people, and I know some of them, never would actually tell them why they were the way they were. They lived good, they looked good, they looked moral, but if you don't tell people why, it does them no good. They just think you're a good person. And what does that do? That doesn't elevate Christ, that elevates you. And that is of no value to God at all. If you're a Christian this morning and you have not witnessed to somebody this last month, shame on you. Do you really believe that Jesus died on the cross for you and you're going to hell if you, don't, if you didn't make that decision? Do you really believe it? Do you really care about people enough that it makes a difference and you want them to go to heaven? Or are you thankful you got your ticket and you're headed there and nobody else matters? It may sound tough, but that's the reality if you are not witnessing. Because every one of us here rubs shoulders with people who need Jesus. And yes, they may not want to hear about it. We don't know that. You don't know that. Don't assume it. You know, um, something I told this family. They were assuming that the other family would be totally condemning to them because of this situation that just happened. And I tried to help them through it because I remember having those same thoughts. You know, this... Uh, whole situation brought out, you know, when Mike died on our farm 15 years ago. So <clears throat> I could empathize with him in a good way, right? Um, but I told him, I said, uh, don't assume that, that these, this family hates you and is blaming you for the death of, of their father, whatever, son. And you know what? They weren't. The mother of this man is a godly woman, and, uh, and they went to the wake and she went up to the boy. And told him she was praying for him. Sorry. Didn't know I was going to cry today. <laughs> and Pastor Wall did the the service and uh, anyways that night they, they, they had expressed to him that family that they couldn't believe the reaction and uh, <laughs> he was actually well yeah that's the way they're supposed to act that's what God would want you know he was just matter of fact and it kind of blew him out of the water a little but it was pretty cool anyway but anyways what I was why, only reason I mentioned it was because the assumption of that and they were assuming that was going to be that way and I said don't assume you don't know. Just do what you need to do to show how much you cared and uh, let, leave the results to God and, and then that's the way it turned out. But a lot of times we do the same thing as far as witnessing to others, don't we? We assume they're not going to want to hear. We assume they're going to reject it. And we assume they're not going to care at all. When in reality, maybe they're going to look that way when we speak to them, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they actually think that way. Right? 
You understand that? Not, not everybody, when you share the gospel, even though they want to hear it, are going to show you they wanted to hear it. <laughs> That's what, but the point is, we can't save them. Do you mean when you fail, or do you mean just any time? No, just oh. any time. Yeah. You get kids and all the rest of you, especially, it's hard to be weak and be loving when you're attacking them so much. But that's when you can show meekness the best. It's the hardest, but they know it's the hardest, and that's when meekness is a reality, when you can show it in those moments, and that's why they're attacking. They're saying, is this guy the real deal? And if they get under your skin, they're going to keep going. That's just the way it is. <laughs> but they are. There's an aspect that they're trying to see. If, are you the real deal or not? Do you really believe what you say you believe? You know, and so they're going to call you out on it for sure. All right, meetness gain. Have you heard of the preacher who had a message entitled, Meetness and How I Attained It? He said he hadn't delivered his message yet, but as soon as he got an audience big enough, he was going to give it. Do I need to say it again? Okay, I'll say it again. Have you heard of the preacher who had a message entitled, Meekness and how I, att uh, how I Attained It? He said he hadn't delivered his message yet, but as soon as he got an audience big enough, he was going to g give it. In other words, it's a joke. It totally goes against itself, right? It's like telling somebody, Boy, have I gotten humble lately. I am growing in humility moment by moment, and even as we're talking together, I'm getting more humble as we speak. It'd be awful hard to believe that when somebody was talking like that, wouldn't it? But whether it's true or not, I'm not going to say because it depends on the situation, I guess. Okay, so how do we get, how do, how do we gain meekness? Is it something that we conjure up on our own? Is it something that we can manufacture in ourselves? I'm going to be meek today? Uh, I'm going to say no. Number one is start somewhere. Uh, X1 one through four, just we'll read that to start with here. Jesus promised something. One through four? Is that what I want? Four and five, I'm sorry. It says, Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, You heard it from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Jesus promised that, you know, I'm going to leave so that you can have the Holy Spirit that will come back come to you. Uh, now, did we have to do anything to get the Holy Spirit? No, that's a whole other message, I guess. But all we have to do is believe in Christ as our Savior, and the Holy Spirit indwells us. But, look, but God, Jesus sent the Holy Spirit back. So let's look at Galatians 5, 22. Many of you may know that passage, that verse, uh, 22 and 23. A lot of my kids have memorized it over the years. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. And it says this. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. But that word can also be meekness. Self-control. Again, such there is no law, right? So, where does meekness come from? The spirit that was given to me at the moment of salvation, I have this character quality even if I'm not using it. You get that? We have been given the fruit of the spirit. Whether we exercise that fruit or not is based on a verse down below that. So it was a gift. It's not something I can manufacture, but it's something I can develop. Do you see the difference? I can't you know, find it and get it, but I can do something about it. Look at 525. If we live by the Spirit, in other words, if we are saved and have the Holy Spirit residing in us, then we should also walk in the Spirit. So if we live in the Spirit, we should walk in the Spirit. That means to be in step with, right? 
That means to be along the same lines, to be going together in one direction. So it means that I have the choice on whether I live by the Spirit or not. I have the choice on whether I'm meek or not. It's a choice. I have it, the ability to have it from God um, through the power of His Spirit, but I have a choice whether I'm going to walk in it. Colossians 3.12, over a couple pages to your right. So we're to walk in the Spirit, our part. God's part is He gave it to us at the moment of salvation. We couldn't manufacture it. He gave it to us. But our part is to walk in the Spirit. Our part is also 3.12. And he says, So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. That word meekness is there again. What are we to do? What did it say? Two words. Put it on. It's like if I had a coat here. I take It's my coat. I have it. But it doesn't do me any good until I, if I go out in sub-zero weather and leave my coat in the house, is it doing me any good? If I uh, even carry it, is it going to do me much good? It's when I put it on. Put on meekness. Let it be a part of who I am. Let it envelop me. And then 1 Timothy 6.1 tells us to do something else. Along the same lines. First uh, Timothy six eleven. If I said one, I'm not sure. And it said, "But flee these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and meekness or gentleness." So, what is he saying? What is he challenging? Paul is challenging Timothy, but in a secondarily challenging us to do what? Pursue it. Does that mean I'm actively involved? Or I just wait for it to happen. God, while I sit here on the couch, clothe me. You know, sometimes we have that attitude towards the things of God, don't we? God, I'm going to wait until you do all this for me. And when you do, then I'll get going for you. God says, no. no. I, I have done it for you, but now it's your part. Pursue. Put it on. Be actively involved in this process of meekness. James says, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. The problem is that we're getting in the way, usually, of what God is trying to do in our life. And if we're trying to lift ourselves up, if we're trying, if it's about us instead of about God, if it's about us instead of about others, then we usually we get in the way of helping others at all. Conclusion. If you want to be useful to God, develop the character he desire, the desires. Because pride, which is the opposite of meekness, gets us in the way of what God wants to do. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Lord, this is a character quality that we are not only needed you to give it to us, but we need you to help us to have it really lived out in our life. Lord, in Acts 1, when you talked about given us the Holy Spirit. You, you referred it to that we would receive power. There it's mostly, you know, specifically talking about witnessing. But that power of the Holy Spirit is to help us to live out the character qualities of the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit. Lord, may we not try to do it in our own strength, but may we truly rest on the power that you have already provided for us to live out meekness in our lives so that it changes the way we react with others so that it changes the way we react with your word so that it changes the way that we share the gospel and the motivation to do it to begin with Lord help us to become meek people not weak not milk toast, wimpy Christians. There's enough of them. But may we be powerful Christians, not in our own strength, but in yours, Lord. Because like Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Thank you for that promise.